Hey, come see us in Ashland, Virginia, Athens, Georgia, Rutherford, New Jersey at the Icarus Festival, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. Go to jimmydoor.com for a link for tickets. Sick. We have our new guest, uh, uh, Haz Aldin. I hope I'm saying his last name correctly. He's a self-described Marxist-Leninist and patriotic socialist. He's based in Detroit, Michigan. He's the founder of the media collective Infrared, which airs on YouTube and Twitch and features live debates, commentary, and current events and discussions on politics, philosophy, and culture. Uh, please welcome to the show, Haas. Hey, Haas, how are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic. Good now, good. you tweeted this out. So this is why I have you on. So you tweeted this out. You say, what if I told you that everything you're taught about this man, meaning uh, Kim Jong-un, and his country is propaganda. What if I told you that North Korea is vilified because it is the one of the only countries in East Asia which refuses to be enslaved by international banksters? What if I told you that all its troubles were the result of an extremely harsh sanctions imposed by the U.S. regime? What if I told you that people in North Korea are in general happier that in the South, no homeless, no organized crime, no prostitution or pornography, no unemployment and abundant housing for all. Sure, they don't have as much access to consume goods, but they what they have is dignity and freedom, freedom from being enslaved by foreigners and banksters. Their land, people and culture is free from the filth and poison of today's Western societies and they take better and they are better off for it. Do you really think the media has been telling you the truth? about North Korea. Well, um, that's interesting. So now, since I started this show, I've lived through a lot of hoaxes perpetrated by the mass media and uh, the establishment. None of, so you know, the first one was Russia Gate. Second one was the Syria gas attacks in the Syria war. It was the Libya war, it was the Ukraine war, it was COVID. I mean, you can't, it's, it's unbelievable how we are the most propagandized people in the world in the United States, and they don't know it. They have no idea they're being propagandized. They think that Sean Hannity, Anderson Cooper, and Rachel Maddow are telling them the truth. They think the New York Times and the Washington Post, owned by the richest handful of billionaires in the world, are somehow giving you the real truth about their class and their, their plans. They're not. So when I read that, I was like, I could believe that. Um, so tell me, where, what do you base this on? Have you been to Korea and how do you know this? I haven't myself been yet. I think I plan on going soon, but I have colleagues and friends who have gone, who are very knowledgeable on the topic, who have spoken to people there. But the main thing that I base it on is that when you actually do the research for yourself, when you investigate all of these ludicrous claims they make about North Korea, everything, all these ridiculous claims made by that woman, Yenmi Park or whatever, all of these other kinds of uh, tabloid stories, you go and find the primary sources and it almost always comes down to the extremely contradictory, extremely inconsistent narratives and stories told by defectors, all of whom seem to contradict each other. And, and then why is this? Why are defectors coming from the North telling all these wacky, bizarre stories about what's going on there? Well, you actually study and investigate it, and it turns out there's a financial incentive. They're being financially incentivized to make these ridiculous claims because they get more attention for it, because they get paid for it, and so on. So, so I mean, you got to so, ask the question, why, why is there such a market for these ridiculous, insane claims that are made about North Korea, about how nobody's allowed to get the same haircut as Kim Jong-un and all this other nonsense. Why, why, are, why are we consistently told and depicted uh, you know, that this, this is an insane kind of crazy country? Uh, it's totally 1984, totally Aurelian. It's a surreal country and so on. Well, I would answer that by saying that that is a country which in the eyes of the U.S. and which in the eyes of NATO and the U.S. empire, basically, isn't supposed to exist. You know, and we can go deep into the history of it, uh, starting from the Korean War. But the whole context was when the Koreans liberated themselves from the Japanese, the Soviets and the Americans agreed that they would uh, occupy different parts of Korea. Now, on the Soviet side of things, the Soviets packed up their things and left because they were requested to, whereas the U.S. would not let go of their occupation. And they helped put down several rebellions in the South, actually, which didn't want the U.S. to be there and also didn't want the U.S.-backed dictator to rule uh, South Korea, to rule Korea. 
So, and then through many, through 3,000 border provocations um, before the 1950, June 25th date, which is what we think the start of the Korean War is, you know, uh, it's only after so much was done to attack on the border, so much was done to undermine uh, the sovereignty of the Korean people that the North Korea proper that's in our textbooks begins. And that war was never, not a lot of people know this, it wasn't ever resolved. So formally speaking, Korea, the Koreas are still at war. And in a sense, we're still at war with the DPRK. So it's not supposed to exist, basically. It's a society that's not supposed to exist. Why is North Korea at war with South Korea? Because uh, neither of them recognizes the other. They both lay claim to a unified Korea, especially the North, especially the DPRK. They, they consider the South... Uh, and I think this is fair to be an illegitimate uh, state uh, because of its historical origins. Because, again, it was a military dictatorship backed by U.S. occupation forces, which had to slaughter tens of thousands of people um, in the beginning in order to maintain its iron grip. And actually, South Korea was a dictatorship for most of its history. It, it was only very recently. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was the late 70s or the early 80s that South Korea became a so-called democracy and its dictatorship ended. So people always, first of all, is um, people say that North Koreans aren't allowed to leave their country. Uh, and and they and the ones that are allowed to leave, they have to leave some of their family behind. So they have an, they, so they don't, they, their incentive is to come back. Is that true? And why is that? Uh, it's not true. Uh, it's actually enshrined in their constitution. I mean, maybe you don't believe the legitimacy of that, that they do have the right to go abroad for work and for other kinds of things. The what worry. About, yeah, sorry. Are, are they allowed to just freely leave or do they have to have a specific reason to leave the country? Of course, they have to have a reason. And I think that's actually how it works in any country, because when you think about it, if you want to leave by just leaving on your own two feet, you know, I don't really think there's going to be a great deal that's going to be in your way. What actually happens when it comes to defectors and people leaving illegally or legally, for that matter, is it's always organized on a social level. It's always organized through what connections you have, who's actually transporting you across the border, who's actually taking you there, who's arranging the trip and so on and so on. So if, you know, if if that is being arranged by the government, of course, the government there has to be a valid reason for it. You can't go, for example, the worry is that you're going to go and leak intelligence to the enemy because yeah, this is still on Google. You search, it's in 2017, and it's, get this, they posted $860,000, the South Korean government, for anyone from the North, anyone from the DPRK to defect who will share uh, important intelligence that will help the security of the South. So they're, they're bribing people with a million dollars to cross to um, basically share uh, intelligence secrets, state secrets that could endanger the security, the but, DPRK. So this is their main worry. Their main worry is not really just people who you know decide that they want to fully cut themselves off from their families, from their village, from their communal upbringing, and just go on their own and leave. That's not really the problem. The problem is that the border itself is uh, heavily militarized in both directions. And, you know, there's a, there's always the pros the possibility that if someone is leaving and you don't know why they're leaving and there's no reason that's being given and it's being done illegitimately, that it could be done for the purposes of undermining the security. So if I wanted to leave the United States and I wanted to go to Mexico or Europe or Antarctica, the government doesn't stop me. You're right, but there's a crucial difference. The crucial difference is that we basically control the entire world. You know, we're not under siege by everywhere in the world, and the whole world isn't at war with us. And our existence on the international scene is not some kind of, you know, scandal and, and something that has to be maintained. Through, I mean, imagine in 1776, we have our revolution, we overthrow the British, and yet we are constantly, not just in 1812, but constantly, every month, every year, constantly, there's so many plots, so many attempts to basically destroy 
our efforts to liberate ourselves from colonialism to the point where we have to start getting, uh, there has to be a, a permanent state of heightened vi- vigilance on our part just to defend, you know, the ability to say, hey, we don't want the British troops to come and occupy our country. So I, I'm not, I am far from saying that I think that the DPRK is a totally loose, lax society where there's, you know, no level of heightened or extraordinary extreme vigilance or anything like that. They are, but I think understanding their circumstances, it's understandable. They are literally under siege. And, you know, we have not, there not a day has gone by where we've just let, left them alone. If we were willing to leave them alone, why do we have to sanction them to the point where they are cut off from the most basic food, medical, uh, industrial, and so on and so on supplies? Like if you do business in the DPRK and get caught, you are cut off from the entire U.S.-led uh, global financial system completely. And it's like, you know, I-, I hope that with the rise of BRICS and with the rise of de-dollarization, the things will change considerably. But they are in a very tough spot, and I really think that their ability to maintain what they have and maintain a functional society with a primary, you know, industrial base, a primary provided primary standard of living for its people. I think it's very impressive given the circumstances. So you wouldn't deny that um, North Korea is what we would consider a totalitarian regime run in a totalitarian way, correct? I, I don't think there could ever be such a thing. You know, I mean, it's it's I I find this strange narrative that we often tell about the so-called rogue states. On the one hand, these are completely omnipotent governments that have absolute total control over every aspect of everyone's lives. And there's nothing limiting their power whatsoever. And on the other hand, they're grossly incompetent. They can't even function or get anything done. They have no technology and they're basically a backwater, you know, completely um incohesive, completely corrupt, basically shithole, you know, excuse my French. I find this to be a contradictory narrative that we're told. And the truth is, is that North Korea, the DPRK, in line with how Asian culture just seems to be in general, is a highly collectivistic society. So the totalitarianism, it's not, quote unquote, the the level of, you know, how much the major decisions about life are are happening at collective and communal levels. That's not from the top down of, you know, one guy or the government having total control. That's more like you're born in a village and that, you know, your village community at this at the most local possible of levels, your culture itself is reinforcing a, a level of collectivism and you know, social solidarity that they just, it's just implicit for them. If there was such an extraordinary degree of force and direct coercion to basically meddle in people's lives in a way that they found to be unnatural and incompatible with their common sense, I mean, North Korea would have to be greatly more technologically advanced and greatly more kind of um, powerful as a state than what we uh, claim it is already, right? We say the opposite. So I think a lot of that really just comes down to cultural differences and combined with, obviously, the circumstances I mentioned before. And so how do you know that the North Korean people are actually happy? Because I've always been told they're miserable. Well, I, I you, you have to start with where are the claims that they're miserable coming from? And you have to start with from why Bill is Gates. it that... <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then <laughs> what I find intriguing is that there's defectors who were promised by human traffickers and um, basically people who, for a living, they smuggle people through the border. This is what's interesting. This is very overlooked. A lot of the times, they're duped to basically be brought over the border, and they're told, "Oh yeah, life in the South, it's perfect. Yeah, you know, all your everything is abundant. It's total luxury. It's much better. There's no, all the problems that you face." are gone and eliminated. Then they find themselves in the South. They find themselves in debt. They find themselves grossly alienated, totally with no kind of communal values, no fat, no extended family system, support system that's there that's so fundamental to them. Uh, you know, they, a lot of pornography, a lot of kind of drugs, a lot of uh, a huge American presence that they just They were raised to find distasteful, I guess. And then you find out that some of these defectors, and you can look this up, I'm not making it up. Some of them genuinely say, yeah, I was tricked. You know, life was better in the North. We were happier in the North. And as a matter of fact, if I wasn't going to be punished for it, if I had returned, I would like to return. So some of these people actually want to return back to the North after getting a taste 
of what the South is. Well, can but they? you know what? I, sorry, can they? Well, I, uh, I probably not. You know, my best guess would be no, because if they crossed it illegally and if they're trying to re-enter, they would probably be suspected of being a spy or something. You know, doesn't sound so great. They'd probably, yeah, they'd probably have a hard time. But again, it needs to be highly emphasized. This is not just a difference of, you know, which societies would you prefer to live in? It's more of a question of sovereignty. You know, what right did the U.S. have to go into Korea and force an occupation on them and force a dictatorship on them that they didn't want? During the time of the U.S. occupation in the South, 60, it was something 60, over 60 percent of people wanted the U.S. to just immediately leave. There were so many uh, major uprisings that were brutally repressed that spontaneously happened because they wanted to overthrow that dictatorship in the U.S. presence. And for better or for worse, uh, Kim Il-sung was the most popular man in Korea at the time in both the North and the South. And uh, again, in the North, the Soviet troops packed up their things and left. They didn't need to be there. They weren't there occupying it or nothing. Wasn't China in some conflict with, I know they were with us with Korea, but did they have a conflict with Russia over Korea? Yeah, actually, yeah, it's interesting you point, it, point out that because the Soviet Union wanted a completely non-confrontational stance in Korea. They did not want to beef with the U.S. about Korea. They didn't. They really didn't want any kind of war to happen that they'd have to be dragged into. That would have been a nightmare for them in their mind. So that was also part of the reason why they were so willing to just pack their things up and leave. Uh, the Chinese were not there, but at the outset of the war and the intense fighting, that's when the Chinese decided to come and back up Korea because they perceived, and I think they were correct about this, uh, the overall ambitions in Asia, starting in Korea, ended in China as well. They wanted to use it as a launching pad to undermine China's sovereignty. So that's kind of why they made that decision. So it's it's still... Uh, so, I don't know if I'm booking my next vacation there. I'm going to be honest. So <laughs> what well, about... I, I like to emphasize it. It's, it's a country that views itself at war and, you know... Yeah, I, I don't really think too. I believe you. Look, <laughs> yeah. the, the evil crap that the country I live in does, just based on the problems it actually created, so it could do that, it's pretty bad. So imagine you yeah. live in a country run by one family, and you're right. You you have the United States to fear. I imagine it'd be a lot of abuses of my individual rights in that country, and I don't mean like not caring about family because it turns out lots of people care about their family. I mean something that would make you desperate enough. To go, oh, I can get 800, you know, if it's so great to take a million dollars to get the hell out and sneak out, you shouldn't have coyotes to get out of your own country. They're supposed to sneak well, you into a country. Think about it. If, if you need to bribe people with a million dollars to leave their country, the, the, the incentive to just pack your things up and go probably isn't that strong to begin with. I think that every society has... You know, criminals has people at odds with society. They just can't adjust. They can't fit in. We have criminals here. There's criminals in the South. There's criminals everywhere in the world. If you're a criminal in in uh, the DPRK, you know you're highly incentivized to to cross the border instead of getting caught and sentenced. Well, you three for your generations crime or of your family, is it not? Is that not true? Well, what's the source? We have to look at the primary sources. The great and leader's book, Kim Il Sung, the guy that defected. Uh, what's there's a great documentary about the guy that defected because yeah. a bunch of people have defected from America, you know, the mind control craze of uh, the 50s or whatever after the Korean yeah. War. Some tr uh, troops defected to North Korea and they claimed that the United States was using bioweapons on, on these people, and so obviously they were under mind control, and that's why they were saying these crazy things. So that's why we had all that Manchurian candidate stuff. I don't doubt any of the evil crap America did at all. I'm just saying, uh, if I'm a guy, I, I wouldn't want to have that as a justification. I really don't care about national sovereignty. If I got to live somewhere miserable, I don't, and I, I don't want to have to sleep well, around I think to that's, watch what that's I want, kind of, I want. You know, and but I, and I, I think I, that's I've been not in Asia. Yeah, yeah. They all just I think, do things I think, secretly. <laughs> I think I think your view is your own, and you know that's that's perfectly understandable, but. It's not a perspective on life that's shared with everyone in the world. And I, I think there's many Americans who probably disagree with that. Our slogan was what? For 1776, it was liberty or death. It wasn't even 
liberty or, you know, we're going to go through some hardships and it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's liberty or death. So if you're willing to die to have sovereignty, to have your freedom as a country and not be under, you know, the occupation of colonialism, I think it's understandable that the Koreans uh, in the North are willing to go through and endure a great deal of hardship, at least compared to what they would otherwise be dealing with. Uh, to maintain their rights and their sovereignty, you know, and I think I, I, I mean, I, I, I was born and raised in the U.S. I was raised with the story of 1776 and the founding values of this country. So to me, that was very understandable from that angle. Where were, where were, where, where, where are you from? Uh, what state? Michigan. Oh, really? You're born in Michigan? Yeah. What what city? Uh, Metro Detroit area. No you kidding. Know. Yeah. That is, uh, I, I was. Uh, you're uh, you're allowed you, to leave Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Well, know. yeah, you're, yeah. You that's, say, that. Thank God for that. You know. <laughs> and do you uh, do you speak other other languages? No. Really? Uh, I, I I I. You really are an I American. Can, <laughs> I can I can kind of um understand a little bit of Arabic, and I I I under I can speak a little bit of it, like very basic, hi, bye, that kind of oh, stuff. Okay. But fluently, no. Okay, and you and Jackson are doing a show, right? Yeah, actually, me and Jackson are doing a show in two days, actually, on Friday. It's going to be in Dearborn, and, uh, you know, if you want to get tickets, it's going to be infrared.gg slash events. We still have some for that, but yeah, You're Jackson's actually... Tickets are still available for that event? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, shocked. I, I'm Honestly, uh, I'm shocked because G. Jackson's very popular, so are you. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, we have some, not too many, but there's some. Are you still. doing two shows or one? We're doing one. It's our first show, so we're doing one. Okay. Um, are you? But there's like a. Sorry. Are you videotaping it? Yeah, we'll probably videotape it. Not live stream it though. Okay. You should definitely videotape it. Three cameras. Is it? Who else is on the show? You and you, uh, you Jackson. Anybody else? I don't know if you know them. They're the Midwestern Marks crowd. The Eddie Liger from TikTok, uh, Carlos Noah, Danny Shaw. I don't know if you've had him I on I know before. Danny Shaw. I've had him on. Yeah, him. he's coming as well. Talk about his experiences. Yeah, our show is actually, speaking of 1776, our show is called Free America to Free Palestine because our whole thing is like, before we can free talk about freeing Palestine, we actually need to free this country from its own kind of occupation because the government doesn't represent the interests of the people. No. I mean, you know, not in America. This is a demo <laughs> this is a democracy. This is the biggest state in NATO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always like to say this. You know, I actually I came back from Russia, and I, I went to customs, right? And um, obviously, they take your phone, they take everything. Do it. I was kind of shocked though because some lady was like, "Hey, give me your phones, and I'm going to go in the back and go through your phone. Don't worry, I'm not going to download anything." I said, "Wait, wait, wait a minute, you're." You're just going to go back and look through my phones, like whatever you want, like even private stuff, whatever. She's like, yeah, you know, and I'm like, OK, can I say no? And she's like, no, she takes my phone. She goes, but here's this brochure and this brochure is going to tell you you go on this website and these are all your rights. And then I'm like, oh, how how nice. And then I was sitting down with the brochure and I thought to myself, I was like, you know, this is a country. That's. Just as authoritarian as any other country. It's just, there's just as much government control and monitoring as any other country. But we have a great advantage. Our country is themed as a free democracy. Right. It's like Disney Park, it's the theme. So they're going to take your phone and, you know, go look through all your stuff in the back. But while you're waiting for them, while they're doing that, you get a nice brochure to tell you about all the rights you have. And yeah, stuff. I said this to Malice. I like what they're going to make us in North Korea. That's what a 15 minute city is. You just stay where you are. <laughs> You need to go travel too far. Yeah, They're, they admire the shit out of North Korea. Well, we certainly They're gonna make us that. So that's the thing, right? So they make. I don't. It, I don't yeah, they make it. So we. I've tried to explain to people. We live in a surveillance state. You have no rights. You have no privacy. 
Uh, the government can throw you in jail, indefinite detention. All they have to do is say you're a terrorist. So anybody who actually stands up against the establishment, that's they're even it, whether you're powerless like the Yuhurus or the Stop Cop City protesters, or you're powerful like Donald Trump and his MAGA political movement. So the you, you can't step out of line. They're, and look what they're doing to the, the most decorated journalist of my generation, which is Julian Assange. And he's being tortured in a prison right now for telling the truth. And the reason why other journalists aren't being tortured in prisons is because they aren't willing to tell the goddamn truth. That's why. Because they all go along. You get a $35 million contract at MSNBC like Rachel Maddow for being a willing tool of the war machine, which is what she is. Same thing with Sean Hannity. Same thing with Anderson Cooper. Okay? And you get fired if you tell the truth about the war machine or the establishment, which is what happened to Tucker Carlson. Right? Again, uh, so you get rewarded for lying. And so this idea that you live in a free country is just an idea. It's not real. You don't live. What America is the world's largest penal colony, right? We and, imprison more people uh, than China in road numbers. So this idea that uh, we live in a free country, you don't live in a free country. You don't even live in a democracy. We live in an oligarchy, right? And so uh, it might seem on the surface a little better than North Korea, but uh, you don't. You probably have just as few rights as they do there. Um, I mean, I, I have no doubt that this is a way more luxurious country than probably most overwhelmingly most of the world. Not, I mean, to say nothing of North Korea, far more luxurious. But, you know, you think I think about the topic of happiness and, you know, to me, it seems to make more sense that real happiness is when life makes sense to you. Real happiness is when you actually have, um, you know, a, a pattern and a way of life compatible with other people around you, a support system, social support system of families, villages and communities where you have a place and you have a belonging to some kind of, uh, you know, to some kind of context, to some kind of society in some way. You can contribute to the culture. You can be part of a culture. I think a huge source of the unhappiness we see in the West and in South Korea, which, by the way, their suicide rates, including in Japan, it's pretty high, you know, and, you know, some data I've seen, I don't know how they're getting it exactly, but it's way higher than the North. And I think a lot of that's because of the alienation, you know, people are just cut off from any kind of, any kind of, you know, uh, community and any kind of way of life that's just compatible with their existence. They're constantly being pushed on edge, being completely stressed out, being, you know, overwhelmed with their dopamine receptors with all this kind of, um, you know, uh, targeted mass media. I mean, you know, you th I, I, I think it's an important point. It's like to in a totalitarian society, all you're thrown at is the regime propaganda to brainwash you. And I'm like, how much ads are thrown our way? Right. 100%. At every level of life, that's completely unavoidable. Well, that, that, those are just, you know, people in the free market giving you ads. And I'm like, really? Because I look up that company and who owns that company. It turns out it's probably like five conglomerates or something that own the whole damn thing. And I'm pretty sure those people are not just doing and this they stuff control for the economic. government. That's why we have ad blockers. Exactly. And those same yeah. people control the government. I mean, Bill Maher is on a book tour now and he's going in conservative media and he's finding out just how propagandized he is. He he thought Hillary Clinton never denied the election. <laughs> and he, he thought that January 6th they killed cops. He's got, he thinks the board, he has so many crazy ideas. And of course he thinks uh, the problem in Gaza uh, started on October 7th. <laughs> and he thinks the problem in Ukraine started uh, with Putin's invasion of uh, the Donbass. He doesn't know anything. He's See, completely. It's the he should be the poster child for American propaganda and how well it works. Because that's what this media tour is turning out to be for him. But uh, we didn't want to poison his mind. See, this is a, I, I don't look at it as North Korea good. I look at it as we do that. I don't want to be you know Canada now. <laughs> they Canada's, can go back to things you said in the past. Canada is. They have the three generations rule now. The, the, the way I see pass. it is a people should have the right as a people to decide their fate. You know, we shouldn't be going up to some other country saying, no, you can't sure, have this. I agree. You know, but I'm telling way. you, uh, as soon yeah. as I, somebody, the thing where somebody's on lockdown. I, I don't think we should model America after Korea or China or any other well, country. Do you understand what Korea is? They, it, it's yeah. a real big like debt. Christianity took off real big there because it's a real yeah. dad worship kind of place. So, for example, South Korea, you got in the north, you got the one family. South Korea, it's Samsung. I can't remember the other company. Right. Yeah, they're work. all oligarchs. They're yeah, all you major know, it's, elite. It's, it's like a mini yeah. version. It's actually kind of interesting. But 
the Moonies, that right wing church that the CIA right, loves. posted up, yeah. they went in and pushed into Japan. That's why that president got shot. Oh, okay. but that, that guy that made a wooden gun like that movie and killed yeah. the president, ex president, that was because his life, his mom, his parents' lives got ruined by uh, Moonies. Oh, and uh, anyway, there is a cultural thing to go into that. I just, one, I, I, I got no praise for anybody giving me, one, I'm being censored or what I can look at as censored, you know, beyond obvious common sense things. Yeah. I don't want information censored because it's dangerous to the regime. We have that here. That's the thing we were criticizing North Korea That's about, right. wasn't it? Well, that's, that's it's, oh, security. I really don't give a God, I don't care about the security of the prison I'm in. I really that's, don't. That's right. And if it looks bad for the leader, and that could hurt us because we have a bigger enemy, America's doing the same excuses as North Korea. Look, that, that, what, what you're saying makes a lot of sense for us as Americans, especially when we're being pitted up against a government that's actively trying to poison us and destroy us at every level. But also, it's a part of our American culture, right? We don't treat speech the way that Eastern societies do. For us, you know, words and 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 they don't ha see. This is something I, I think it was some Czechoslovak dissident that said this during the cold war he was like look in our societies there's more overt censorship like where there's things we're not allowed to say but the reason for that is because the things we say actually have a direct impact on politics our words are treated as powerful our pen is treated as powerful that's an a priori people's voice matters so that's why it, it has to be suppressed sometimes and whatever but compare that to the west that's why we need where, guns. Where, where we're allowed to say what we want but it has no impact. Uh, it may have a small impact on some levels, but it doesn't have a direct impact to the point where, you know, it's going to cause a crisis and a panic uh, in the leadership directly. I where, it well, has. I well, watched it. Well, we're what? It's, 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 <laughs> in, it's increasingly becoming that way because I think Americans are not, waking up. Yeah. Well, now that people actually do have uh, social media platforms yeah. to say things. Now you're seeing censorship happen because what they're saying actually does have an impact. No, you're right. You're and right. So I mean, that, but I'm saying he's he was talking about during the Cold right, War. Right. I know. I got you. Bush but, era, right? Where people didn't give a damn. They're so, just watching MTV. So, what, and, so the, the, yeah. what we've said here and what we will continue to say is that communism and capitalism end up in the same place. And here we are ending up in the same place. No choice. You got two companies that make planes. One of them is horrible. So you don't have any choice and we don't have any freedom of speech. You have it uh, controlled by a handful of oligarchs and you got the government controlled by those same people. So we live in a surveillance state. With, it's very the close. Yakov Smirnoff routine the from Yakov, the 80s. That's right. We're living in the Yakovs, but it's, but we're totally, we have freedom. It's all lip service. They pay fealty to it, as Chris Hedges We're talked gonna about. Get a helmet to put but on. we don't they really live in it. But Haas, I, I, I have to move on. I, I wish we oh, could yeah, talk no about problem. this all day long. Um, we'll, we'll have to have you back on, and we'll talk about MAGA communism. And nice. I appreciate you making yourself available. Everybody, check out their live show Thank you. this Friday in Dearborn, Michigan. And uh, everybody, check out your uh, YouTube show where you're not allowed to say things that you like to say. We don't have freedom of speech. On YouTube, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm already banned from TikTok. Uh, but yeah. anyway, uh, and of course, thank you Jackson, so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay, it's a great to have you. I had sorry to cut this uh, uh, this conversation short. We'll have you yeah, back no on, problem. and good luck this weekend, pal. Here on tour in Ashland, Virginia, Athens, Georgia, Rutherford, New Jersey, Minneapolis, Ontario, California, Las Vegas, and Chicago, Illinois, and Grand Rapids, Michigan. Go to JimmyDoor.com for a link for tickets. Mm -hmm.